I've realized more and more that media trust is an important window into trusting institutions. And it doesn't look like media distrust means lower social trust, but it can really affect trust in institutions. And if you make money from outrage, you're essentially sowing distrust for money. You're listening to Damn the Absolute, a podcast about our relationship to ideas. Produced by Eradicus. Here's your host, Jeffrey Howard. Welcome, friends, philosophers, and fellow practitioners of ideas. This is Episode 9 of Damn the Absolute. Trust plays a central role in democratic societies. If we can't rely upon fellow community members to act in accordance with generally accepted norms, then we are going to be in a really bad way. Social trust in the U.S. has fallen dramatically. In the early 1970s, around half of Americans said that most people can be trusted. Today, less than a third of Americans feel that way. Similarly, political trust, our faith in political institutions and processes to function properly, has declined as well. In the 1960s, more than 70% of Americans said that they trusted the federal government always or most of the time. Today, that figure hovers around 17%. In an idealized liberal democracy, a healthy dose of skepticism toward politicians and government officials is vital for assuring fruitful outcomes. However, we must be careful so that that accountability mechanism doesn't turn into a cynicism that corrodes democratic norms. Rampant distrust prevents us from solving problems with our neighbors and broader communities. Alternatively, trust helps to grease the wheels of democracy. This enables us to better overcome inherited differences and to arrive at more pluralistic perspectives on the problems we face. Instead, we find ourselves in an increasingly polarized age, where we seem less and less to share common realities or notions of truth. Distrust breeds polarization, and polarization begets more distrust. When we no longer hold the same media or news sources in common, or we maintain a distrust of media institutions, what will prevent us from further polarization? In his new book, Trust in a Polarized Age, political philosopher Kevin Vallier advocates for public reason liberalism as a way of revitalizing social and political trust. He draws on empirical trust literature to argue a way forward for reducing polarization. He proposes that we reinvest in liberal democratic political and economic institutions. High-quality governance, procedural fairness, markets, social welfare programs, and freedom of association. Vallier believes that if we can educate ourselves on how elections and political parties take advantage of mistrust and polarization, we can protect American democracy against new authoritarian threats. This raises some questions. What relationship is there between the scope of government and the degree of political trust that exists in the broader society? Rather than view our political opponents as essentially evil, what might happen instead if we primarily acted as if they were misguided or ill-informed? How much more trust would be fostered if we focused locally, rather than turning our eyes toward Washington, D.C., or to the headquarters of multinational firms? What can we do to restore trust in the media? And what hope do we have of breaking the distrust divergence feedback loop? I hope you'll contribute to the conversation. Well, Kevin, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks so much for having me on. It's a ritual for us here at Damn the Absolute to try and loosen up some of our viewpoints. What's a foundational view you've had about the world that has actually shifted dramatically in your adulthood? It was my conversion to Christianity early in my 20s. So I'd been an atheist all my teenage years. That was pretty dramatic. And then I've shifted uh, denominations recently from Lutheran to Eastern Orthodox, and that was a pretty big change as well, neither of which I expected until maybe a year, two years before they occurred. I've shifted philosophically a number of different times, a very complicated relationship with libertarian political thought, a mostly positive one, but it's sort of varied. And I've become gradually less doctrinaire with time, although actually there's been a slight uptick in my doctrinarianness over the last three or four years. So 
I have complicated relationships with my religious and political views. I have adopted new ones. So, yeah, I was a, a liberal Democrat who worked on a, the Gore campaign in the fall of 2000, but then I went libertarian. And so I've changed views on lots and lots of things. Also, I, I've, I've turned against meat eating in the factory farm lately. And that's been another big change, has changed my eating habits. I'm curious, I don't want to dig too much down this road, but I'm be interested in knowing what were one of the bigger reasons of your shift denominationally. Yeah. Oh, well, that's an interesting story. It would take some time because there were a lot of a lot of arguments. But I think one of the things that really attracted me was their lively sense that becoming a more moral is available to us because of the very weak influence of Augustine and orthodoxy and their devotion. So the leaders of the bishops are basically all supposed to be monastics. And so this one reason the Orthodox Church can be so hard-headed, monastics are especially devoted, right? So they can be a little doctrinaire. But it means that spiritual discipline is a feature of uh, Orthodoxy that never disappeared. And there are people through the work of people like Richard Foster and Dallas Willard and Protestant community that are recovering the spiritual disciplines. But they don't have an engagement with Eastern Orthodoxy, but the Eastern Orthodox Church it's just trying to set things up so there's progress in the spiritual life, not that you do of your own. So that was one thing I think I found really attractive. Another thing is just the worship is incredible. And it's not just a matter of aesthetics, but their whole theology of worship is, is, is profound. It even extends into their theory of the mind and the soul about what worship even is. And so I found that that really ex extraordinary as well. And being connected to the historical church, and that often leads Protestants to become Catholic, or they stay Protestant because they think there's too much centralization in Catholicism. But that once you start comparing kind of the more conciliarist Eastern Orthodox theology to Catholicism and Protestantism, it looks pretty solid in church history, and it doesn't look too centralized. And so it just seemed like it was more like the historic church. I hope we can come back to some of the, the religious institutions you're talking about, because today we'll be discussing trust and its decline in the United States and why that is the case. And so in your recent book, you are talking about the decline of trust in the United States, and you use the framework of public reason liberalism to analyze that. What exactly is public reason liberalism? Well, so sort of back up and, and give, give an account of liberalism and then the sort of liberalism, public reason liberalism is. So I understand the liberal tradition very broadly as something that's getting off the ground self-consciously in the 17th century with the idea that people are naturally free and naturally equal. That is, people have not just equal dignity, which is an idea in the Christian West that long hates liberalism, but that people are not naturally born into any particular hierarchy other than, say, their family. And so that claims of authority over one another have to be justified in terms that preserve equality. So this is where consent theories of political obligation in the state come from, because it's, it's a problem generated by natural liberty and the fact that we don't we aren't born with kind of claims on each other's behavior in the same way that people had thought in previous times. But then there are types of liberalism, not just with respect to things like economic liberties or lack thereof, how you feel about capitalism. That's not the one with which public reason liberalism is primarily concerned. Some take to follow from a concern with freedom and equality, the idea that the state should be neutral between different religious beliefs. So that's a part of the liberal tradition from very early on, from Locke, where you get broadly Protestant toleration. And even I think the toleration of the sort of Catholic that doesn't think the Pope has political authority. They're called Gallic and Catholics, or French Catholics cases. So but Locke has a fairly broad range. Uh, Roger Williams sets up one of the, the first sort of openly tolerant, constitutionally tolerant regimes in Rhode Island, tolerates Jews, for instance, and non-Trinitarians. Uh, non-Trinitarian uh, Christians, if you want to use that phrase, maybe shouldn't, Unitarians. So you start to see this kind of toleration rolling around, and it's taken to be an implication of freedom and equality, right? Because we're going to try to respect people of different faiths and different perspectives. We're going to try to treat them as naturally free and equal as well. And so the state shouldn't take sides on matters where reasonable people will disagree on religious issues. And this has been broadened gradually to include the toleration of people who have no faith at all. And then there becomes a question about whether you should tolerate people just based on secular conscience, right? And so we start to see that, particularly with secular pacifist exemptions to the draft, 
where the toleration of religion starts to be extended to non non religion. And I think ultimately it will lead to broader toleration of moral disagreement, although we're very bad at that in the United States at present. But I think the same logic applies. OK, well, so suppose we get to the point where we're taking liberal religious toleration and now we're extending it to diverse perspectives in general. How do we justify political order in a way that respects the freedom and equality of all? Well, we want to make sure that the things that the state does can be justified to multiple reasonable points of view, religious, non-religious, different political doctrines, different moral doctrines. And the kind of public reason liberalism I endorse says that there is what's called a public justification requirement on the use of state power. And it just says the state may only permissibly use power when that usage can be justified to multiple perspectives, multiple diverse perspectives. So it evolves out of the liberal tradition and the social contract tradition, but it's kind of like the hot contemporary version of uh, neutralitarian liberalism or neutralist liberalism within political philosophy, although I'm not a proponent of the mainline Rawlsian version that's offered by John Rawls. The description I gave of the view is actually somewhat heterodox. The orthodox view is that, that justifications, public justifications have to occur in terms of public or shared reasons, which are often taken to exclude or downgrade religious viewpoints that are diverse. Mm -hmm. But I've spent some time, a lot of time, working up a kind of post-secular public reason liberalism that treats religious and secular reasons equally. And then, in my view, there end up being a lot more extensive religious exemptions and religious liberties of various kind. So, so go from liberalism to neutralist liberalism, from neutralist liberalism to public reason liberalism, and from public reason liberalism to the sort of heterodox view that, that I have. So hopefully that helps us drill down a little bit to what we're talking about, the interest and in state power being justified to multiple perspectives, to respect diversity of as many kinds as we stably can. I think you nailed it. I, I, it sounds like you've done this before. Oh, dear. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Turning to social trust in the U.S., it's fallen dramatically. I think since the early 70s, around half of Americans said that most people can be trusted. Today, it's less than a third of Americans. What are some of the primary reasons you think we're experiencing this decline? So this is complex. I have a Wall Street Journal article that goes from the Saturday essay, so it goes in a little more detail that people can Google if they just Google Kevin Vallier, Wall Street Journal, and the way I talk about this. But first, let me just back up and talk about the kind of trust we're talking about. So what we're talking about is what's in the literature called social trust or generalized trust. And this is faith that strangers will uphold established norms, roughly. So it's not trust in your family. It's not That's called particularized trust. It's not trust in your good friends. It's trust in representative strangers in your society. And what is it trust to do? Well, it's not what they particularly promised you to do. It's not like trust in an institution where you expect it to produce a certain kind of outcome or to perform in a particular way. It's trust that people will uphold established norms. So things like don't steal, don't kill, but also things that aren't taken to be manifest rights violations, but other kinds of social norms like charitable contributions. Will you return a wallet, someone's wallet or phone if they're left in Starbucks? Do you think that they would do the same for you? A lot of our traffic laws are established norms, like allowing people to merge in oncoming traffic, just being able to trust other motorists. So sometimes it can get very, very refined norms very specific to certain contexts. Social trust occurs when we can depend on people that we don't know to follow important established norms, an array of important established norms most of the time. And we think that the survey data, particularly gathered from the General Social Survey, the World Values Survey, and the American National Election Survey, is probably measuring something, I argue, in the vicinity of that concept. When it asks, particularly what's called the standard trust question, can most people be trusted or can you never be too careful in dealing with people? There are more sophisticated data now and they're on multiple point scales and it's done internationally. But the American National Election Survey, which I actually didn't know this when I was writing the book, I really should have, which was it actually goes back before the early 70s to the 60s and 50s. And back then, we're at about 50, often 55 percent of people saying most people can be trusted. So from the post-war period, we've seen about a 23-point drop. So what I did is I went together and averaged the World Value Survey, General Social Survey, American National Election Survey, and you average them out, we've dropped precipitously. It's, gra it's a gradual drop, but it's a bit even bigger drop. So now we know what social trust is and we know the pattern. So what are the causes? Well, here's the funny thing. We don't know a lot about what causes social trust. 
And one of the reasons for this is that social trust attitudes tend to harden, seem to harden in early adulthood. There's been some really interesting studies on Swedish immigrants who go to lower trust countries because Sweden is an extremely trusting country. And you don't see declines in their social trust if they're over 30 at all, really. But if they're younger, their social trust judgments will somewhat approximate the judgments of their home country or the, their new home country, rather. So it's hard to jostle people's social trust levels when they're adults. Political trust, that is trust in institutions, can be can hugely shift. Like just you change the president, how much you trust the president changes 50 points. <laughs> so, so, you know, that, that can alter on a dime. But social trust attitudes tend to be very stable for the most part. And the crazy thing about the U.S. is we're the only established democracy that is long running democracy, more than 50 years old, where social trust has declined anything like to this degree. So we're a true international outlier. OK, so I didn't I told you we don't know a lot about the causes, but we are an international outlier. So so let me set aside some hypotheses that I think don't work. And then I'll tell you my hypothesis. First of all, ethnic diversity is seen as a cause of social trust or its decline, right? The more ethnic diversity it is, the more different people are, the harder it is to trust each other. It turns out that if you look at countries' overall levels of ethnic diversity, there's either no correlation with social trust or a small negative correlation. And that's because there are many different contexts in which racial or ethnic diversity broadly will matter for trust and many where it does not matter. So for instance, if we added Puerto Rico as a state, the ethnic diversity of the country would increase. But trust levels wouldn't change at all because most people in Puerto Rico interact with Puerto Ricans. I mean, the average trust level you would factor in Puerto Rico, but it wouldn't decline in the continental U.S., right? So if you just increase ethnic diversity, it depends on how it's distributed. If you're in an interracial marriage, too, there's probably not much of an effect on your trust in most people. It's not a negative effect. And it's also the case that if you have workplace diversity, it's not necessarily negative at all because you're having to cooperate with other people and you have to depend on them in all kinds of ways. Here's what really matters, local residential segregation. So if you're in a place where there is, say, the Italian block and the Irish block and the Jewish block and the African-American block, that can cause a lot of problems. The co communities often have very different norms and they oftentimes interact and can become very suspicious of each other and cause lots of conflicts. For instance, low trust between Jewish and uh, black communities in New York City, New York City, particularly in Brooklyn, are like kind of legendary for low trust. But also Protestant Catholic differences in Northern Ireland are fairly local and cause, have caused all kinds of violence, really. So there's lots of context where residential segregation just blows up. And that's the particular powder keg that is trust decreasing. But we haven't actually become that we have our ethnic diversity level has not really changed very much enough to explain the decline because, well, we've gotten a lot more ethnically diverse as a country, but the level of ethnic segregation has somewhat declined. So that's the most common thing people appeal to. I'm going to set that aside. Next most common thing people appeal to, economic inequality. So economic diversity, that you might call. And people say, oh, look, there are these people way, way richer than I am. My society is unfair and they uphold that unfairness. So I trust them less or maybe I trust the rich less because they're very different than I am. It turns out that Gini coefficients, the, the most common measure of economic inequality and social trust levels are highly, uh, very well correlated. And so most trust theorists think there is a, a causal relationship where inequality cues difference and unfairness. And so that reduces social trust. Now, if it cues difference, that's not enough because we know that from ethnic diversity, right? It's not enough to know that there are people different from you in your society. Like if it has to be pretty salient. You have to think people have failed the norms. So people have to look at social, they have to look at difference, economic differences and think they're unfair and that most people are in some way at fault for this which I think also isn't very plausible. What's probably going on is the reverse causal direction. There's good evidence, say from Sweden, that higher trust means a higher preference for redistribution. And it's primarily looks to be because you're just not worried about people wasting the transfer. So you ever heard the old urban legend of like, people have said this to me from South Alabama, where they see someone with food stamps buying something outrageously expensive, or irresponsible like beer and cigarettes and lobster, even though you can't actually do that now, I think. And 
that's a sign of distrust, right? Like people get welfare and then they waste it and it's racially coded in our society. Whereas I have a friend, a Swedish economist who I've co-authored with, and he likes to say, well, in Sweden, we redistribute from the top 90% to the bottom 90%. So what you don't have is the rich directly doing payouts to the poor. So like the whole basis of welfare state distrust does not really exist in Sweden. But it's also the case that when you're more trusting, you, you just in general don't mind redistribution as much. You're just not as worried. So that's probably what's going on is because economic inequality that's pre-fiscal, that is pre-fiscal policy, is not especially well correlated with trust. So anyway, in, in any case, so, so I think we can set economic equality aside. I do think it, it probably has some trust depressing effects and it has increased more in the US and other countries. But in other countries, the economic inequality increases have not affected social trust at all, like in the United Kingdom, where there's been some similar level. There's a couple, I mean, there's a couple of other hypotheses about, about trust formation, but those are kind of the main two. So, so and there, there, there's a, a, a bunch of different other things I could, I could talk about. The main hypothesis that I have, the way the U.S. is just such a big outlier among established democracies, is the radical increase in political polarization. And even though the average person does not exhibit that much polarization along with respect to issues, that is disagreement. There's been a great increase in affective or emotional polarization where you hate or strongly dislike people of the other side. And people exhibit really high levels of partisan distrust now. So 2017, about 70% of Democrats say they distrusted not trust Trump, but Trump voters. And the reverse was true. So, you know, about 70% of Republicans said they don't trust anyone who voted for Hillary. And my hypothesis is that partisan distrust is contaminating our social trust judgments. So the, oh, there's a half a hypothesis. So, so the idea is that our partisan distrust that comes from polarization, that comes from cues and accentuating those particular differences are trust reducing because it's not merely that people look different or they have more money, it's they have different values and the wrong values. And so they're bigoted and so they can't be relied upon. So it's moral difference and moral failing that cues our belief that others are untrustworthy. And I think the fact that today there's as much opposition to inter-party marriage as there was against interracial marriage 60 years ago. So the idea is it's a sign that, that the other side is a moral failure and can't be counted upon in general, because how could they be if they voted for Trump, right? I mean, or how could they be if they voted for Hillary, right? So I think polarization is driving distrust, but I think distrust is also driving polarization. So I think there's some evidence that higher trust societies tend to have more moderates because I think you're more likely to listen to people that you trust. This is pretty obvious in case of media, right? You don't believe media that you distrust. <laughs> so if you distrust other people, you're less likely to moderate your opinions because you think, well, people disagree with me, but I've taken the red pill. And so, you know, now we're in a new epistemic environment and low social trust makes it easier for polarization to take off and think this is one of the horrors we've seen with the capital riots. You can ignite low social trust and then sow distrust in lots of other things, right? Like the average vote counter for Biden. If you ask Republicans, I'm sure they don't trust those people at all because we've had a president who's very good at igniting low trust and very good at accentuating polarization in various respects. I try not to talk too much about Trump just because there's division, but I have been, I think, extremely frustrated and, and shocked by the Capitol riots. But I do think the background of high polarization and low trust, a president could not have convinced uh, the vast majority of his party that there was voter fraud just by saying it over and over again 50 years ago. Because then the other side would say, no, it's not. And then people would think, OK, well, who knows or maybe not. Or the other party would say, yeah, we agree with the other party. This isn't happening. So it's the Republican Party that goes over to Nixon and says, hey, it's over. Whereas we haven't really seen any Republicans resisting Trump until just now, right? With 10 Republicans breaking in Congress to vote and McConnell very likely to vote to remove Trump or bar him from future office rather. So low trust creates the possibility of political polarization. Political polarization accentuates lower trust. This is very probably true. With, it's clear in the data from political distrust. People's trust in the president varies wildly. People's trust in Congress is very low and has been very low for a while presumably because they have the other guys in them. So, Kevin, you mentioned that this lower political trust 
leads to more extreme right-wing politics? Why does it lead to more extreme right-wing politics rather than more extreme left-wing politics? Oh, it's both. I'm sorry if I was unclear. It's just the extreme right-wing politics is more salient at the, over the last couple of weeks, in part because I think a lot of people did have the sense that from the summer, it was really the, the hard left that was violent. I mean, Trump just couldn't believe. He said, our people aren't violent, right? Because the sense anyway, is that you've got these kind of left-wing protest groups and people defending looting and all this kind of stuff over the summer. I mean, the summer is pretty crazy, right? I mean, there's some really important moves, but there's also there was also some important problems. So if we'd been talking in June, the, the left-wing stuff would have been more salient. And you have had some Antifa protests with respect to Biden. So it's just that the right wing salience of right wing, hard right and polarization is just more salient at the moment. But no, actually, low trust and low partisan trust, pretty bipartisan and political trust just is distrust is bipartisan when there's someone else in office. Right. Like Democrats don't trust the government when Trump's in charge, like Republicans don't trust the government when Dems are in charge. One very weird effect of Trump, though, is that I think he got Republicans less trusting in government while he was president because he would attack different parts of the government, like the CDC or the deep state or whatever. So I actually think he probably reduced political trust on both sides. And there's a little bit of evidence of this from the World Value Survey. In 2011, about 15% of people said that the federal government can't be trusted at all. When it was run in 2017, it was about 29%. So we got about a doubling. And the people who say that government can't be trusted at all. And I don't think it's just too big a jump for that to just be Democrats. It could be. It could be that 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 like all Democrats went from don't trust it much to don't trust it all. But I think some Republicans got pushed really down too because Trump's saying stuff like the deep state, the deep state, the deep state, or whatever. So we'll see. I mean, we'll see what happens to trust in government when they do the next wave of the world value survey or or, or what have you. But I want to be very clear. These problems are bipartisan. They are often caused when they perceive a threat from the other side and a threat that means the other side is not reasonable and cannot be dealt with through rational means and so must be opposed with violence. It's clear to a lot of people and especially the stuff you're highlighting, this decline in trust. And it may seem like an obvious question as to trust being a good thing, but why is trust a good thing in a democratic society? So trust isn't really good for you if people aren't trustworthy because it makes you a sucker, right? What you want is trust when there's trustworthiness, but you still want trust to be high in many contexts, not all. So you don't necessarily want high trust in politicians because that means you may monitor them less, which can be bad for democracy. But you do want a lot of trust in democracy, and that's to keep it going and to keep it from degrading. The belief that in voter fraud, I think, may create lasting damage and people's trust in democracy. Or people will say, I don't trust the government because it doesn't allow for real votes or something like that. And you know, tens of thousands of little old church ladies are in on it. So I don't know how that's gonna, gonna go. So not all social and institutional trust is good, but boy, is social trust, great stuff. It's great stuff. It seems to be correlated with all kinds of positive indicators. More economic growth, more economic equality, which I think isn't in itself bad for people on the right, but it's very good for people on the left. Things like lower corruption in government, lower corruption in the legal system, and in many ways, more psychological well-being. You can go outside and you, you know, most people are friendly and, you know, no one's going to rob you. And you can sort of see psych psychological well-being increasing in high trust society. So lots and lots and lots and lots of benefits to high social trust. In fact, from what I could tell, there's not really a downside which is weird. But there would be if social trust were like not well synced with trustworthiness. But I think people kind of update pretty quickly. The weird thing is how stable a measure it is if people update. It suggests that the trust and trustworthiness are in this kind of like tight causal loop that, that means in most societies it, it doesn't, doesn't really change. So social trust, great stuff, great stuff. Political trust, more complicated. We want trust at the most generic levels, right? We want there to be trust in the democratic process. But do we want everyone to trust Trump a whole lot? Well, no. So you want trust in the offices and the procedures and that they will tend to be executed while maintaining something of a skeptical eye towards the particular office holders so that you're monitoring them so that if they misbehave, they can be punished at the ballot box. That's to keep them in line with the formal and informal norms of democracy. So to maintain those norms in effect. 
So you want to trust political institutions when they're effective and not when they're ineffective, or you want to distrust them when they're doing something that is just unjust, right? Like many libertarians are just going to want to distrust the DEA because it's not supposed to be prosecuting the drug war. Like it's doing, like you shouldn't trust it because if it does its job, it's bad, right? That's how many people feel about ICE on the left or among pro-immigration libertarians. Abolish ICE. So you're not going to trust an institution that has a, an evil, you think has an evil purpose when it's competent. And you're not going to trust it when it's incompetent, because why would you? But if there are th branches of government that you think have an important function, like the CDC, well, obviously distrust is going to be bad because they're giving bad advice. Now, on the other hand, if they're not trustworthy, like they're changing their recommendations in ways that are foolish, even given the science, then yeah, you want to distrust them because maybe what they recommend is wrong, right? And it can harm you. But then you say, well, what we want is these important political institutions to be trustworthy. And then we want to be able to trust them because trusting the trustworthy, I think, helps to keep it going and helps people to respond to it. So, so, so one obvious way in which distrusting institutions can be extremely harmful is media distrust, even if, in fact, the media is untrustworthy. So I've just coined this idea of the distrust fallacy, where basically people distrust relatively reliable information source A, and so they shift to less reliable source B. Someone says, the liberal media lies. Check out this YouTube video. So that's the distrust fallacy. And I think we're in that position with the mainstream media. So people start, they want to trust some media, right? Because you don't trust any media at all. You go about in your world and you don't know what's going on. So people really want to trust someone, somewhere, that they're getting good information. And so they distrust the mainstream media. And so then they go to alternative media that are often, but not always, less trustworthy simply because they're governed by fewer norms and they have weaker ability to track information. Hello, friends. Jeffrey here. Please go ahead, take a quick moment to click that subscribe button and rate us. It really helps us to further grow the community around Damn the Absolute. Enjoy the rest of the episode. What hopes do you have for people's trust in media being restored oh it's it's low i've been totally i mean i've totally been black pulled on this since i i got started with this trust project because i've realized more and more that media trust is an important window into trusting institutions and it doesn't look like media distrust means lower social trust but it can really affect trust in institutions and if you make money from outrage you're essentially sowing distrust for money because people get outraged when someone's doing something immoral, right? Or they're being a hypocrite. So there's some norm that we previously relied on people to follow, then they violate. And that can be a ground for trusting them less. So one thing that frustrated me in the summer was that many of the public health officials had been strongly condemning going to church, but there was no really peep from them about the protests. Now, the protests were open air rather than closed. So there's less of a risk from transmission, but many people are very packed together for long periods of time. And that made me trust them less because they were condemning institutions that they don't care as much about and not condemning activities that they do care more about. Because we kind of have the sense that a lot of the elite public health officials are kind of more concerned with racial justice than they are with their, their religious faith, if they have it at all. And so there was a double standard, right? And also just the incredible way that the health infrastructure system has failed. But we'll see if having someone different at the helm changes that, although I tend to doubt that the president has that much power or effect on the way institutions function. What prescriptions do you have that you think might help restore trust in media and therefore restore more political trust? I was talking about how bad distrust in media is, but I didn't answer your question about how to get it back. And the answer that, it's, that saddens me is I don't know a way to bring it back without violating the First Amendment, because lying is protected by the First Amendment. So you can't punish lies. And the difficulty with punishing lies is that people disagree when people are lying. One thing that really freaks me out is that people are calling on Biden to form a domestic terrorism apparatus. And when we formed a foreign terrorism apparatus, it was intensely and immediately abused. We don't have any particular reason to think that terrorism investigating institutions should be trusted, even though we think they have a proper purpose. They're almost immediately used, misused, right? On the one hand, I want these rioters to go to jail. On the other hand, I don't want a permanent 
what did Milton Friedman say? There's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program, right? These things stick around. They change the rationale for themselves. They push for more and more and more money and how if the funding is cut. So I don't want Homeland Security to start investigating political terrorism. Do you know what I mean? I'm worried. I don't trust them to do it right because they, they've done ridiculous, stupid stuff that doesn't matter, like harassing people at airports far beyond what would be warranted. People having to take off shoes, you know, not having you, – you've been there. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So how do we restore trust in media? I don't know because all the solutions I've heard of seem bad. I am worried about both the social media companies having free reign to censor, but also them not having free reign to censor. So I don't really know about what would help with social media reform. I don't know. And, and I mean, First Amendment law is a lot more complicated there than it is, say, with cable news. One thing some people are trying to do, which will, is failing, obviously, and hilariously, is to try to get, say, Fox News removed from cable rosters, which is dumb because they actually have really good reporting a lot of the time. It's, it's the pundits that if you're worried about misinformation, but then there's misinformation from the other side. So it's like, if you're going to push them off, why not push the others off? And that's just going to be a gigantic mess. So again, I don't know. I don't know how to increase trust in media except to emphasize journalistic ethics and hope that they'll behave better, but all their incentives are to manufacture outrage. The nice thing, I think, I expect there to be fewer outrages over the next four years because Trump was able to use outrage in order to keep the left on, in the media on their heels. I understand why he did it, right? Like he wanted to nullify their ability to cause problems, so he just made them angry all the time. And I think a lot of the time he did so completely deliberately because he wanted to deflect them from this or that thing or to discredit them on some issue, rightly or wrongly, he won't say. But So I don't know. Maybe there's still that market for outrage. People are certainly eating it up. Maybe if they're less angry, they won't eat it up as much. Who knows? So emphasize journalistic ethics and try to encourage people to consume a broader range of media sources. I know that's sad, but it's all I've got. Related to this concern around distrust of media is this connection to national discourse. And there's so much focus culturally and politically that pulls us to the national level. If we were to focus more of our lives a little bit more locally on what's happening, do you have hopes that that could bolster more social and political trust rather than us being so focused on DC? I had to cut the federalism chapter because there wasn't enough data. But people do seem to tend to trust their local governments more, and they trust their local media more. Fewer crazy things tend to happen in lo local areas, right? So the local news is kind of less professional, but they're not usually engaged in the same kind of bad behavior. So local media, it's also easier to track the behavior of local politicians. So, you know, when they behave well, like you can kind of tell and you can go to a meeting or a school board meeting or something and see what's going on. So you're not so reliant on the media for your judgment on, about how institutions are functioning. So I think that, yeah, more de a lot more decentralization would help. There are some worries in the United States that maybe we would have more oppression of racial minorities if we were to do this. But, but my response to this is relatively straightforward. If we think in general the federal government is essential for preserving racial equality, then leave racial policy federal and then decentralize other stuff. So let's take as much advantage of federalism as we can. And if we think there are racial issues, then the feds, the feds intervene. There's no reason we can't do a partial decentralization. Plenty of countries have more of it. Canada has more. Switzerland has way more. The main reason we don't do federalism is because of how hideously it was abused in the past in order to maintain slavery and segregation. So unfortunately, things like states' rights get tarred with racism, and sometimes that's what's going on. But like particularly a lot of emphasis on the libertarian movement wasn't really about that at all. And conservatives wanting to decentralize things, I don't think was primarily, at least, if very much at all among, well, there was some conservative intellectuals that weren't, weren't so good on some of these things. But but for the most part, I think their care, concern with decentralization was very well motivated, was, was very well grounded in, in good arguments. And I wish we could have a lot more of it for the reasons that you suggest. But unfortunately, I don't get, I don't, have the opportunity to get into it in the book because there wasn't enough data to say. This may be a similar answer, but it's a related question to federalism. Is there much of a correlation between the 
geographic or territorial size of a democratic country and the level of political trust. For example, comparing something as small as Switzerland or Liechtenstein versus the United States. I've not seen anything broken down by size. But when I think about it, the higher trust countries do tend to be the ones that are medium or, or smaller sized. I could have someone run the numbers and just look at social trust by size, but I don't write off half the, the regression or whatever. I mean, it is an interesting, it is an interesting question. It'd be interesting to look at Belgium, a country where there's like, has been recently a lot of political dysfunction and there's some deep divisions of various sorts, uh, despite being a small country. Your exploration of trust reminds me of the treatment that Robert Putnam gives of social capital, his very popular book, Bowling Alone. How does your conception of social trust differ from the concept of social capital? Well, social capital, to use an ancient, it's kind of your context list. So it's your ability to like look people up and then to create opportunities for exchange or benefit from that. And social trust is a superset. Oh, I mean, a lot of a lot of social capital is when people can build these things not just with immediate people, but pre people in broader networks. And I think that's a function of social trust. Now, some people say social trust is a form of social capital, or that social capital is a form of social trust. I don't care about the conceptual claim, but I do think social trust lays the foundation for expanding social capital. And so that's that's what I think is important. Kevin, you mentioned a few examples from Europe, including Switzerland, in regards to federalism. In the book, you talk about the relationship between welfare programs and trust. And you mentioned there are some welfare programs that are better at fostering trust than others. What characteristics do welfare programs have? So in general, they need to be seen to work, and it helps if they do. But it's important that it provide a level of economic security because I think people tend to trust their governments more when they feel safe. And I actually think, we don't have data on this yet, that when children grow up with more economic security, that they're more likely to be trusting. But we don't know that. That's just, that's just speculation. And some people think that targeted welfare programs where not everybody benefits from, from the program are bad for trust because they create resentment. But then there are universal welfare programs like Social Security that don't create distrust. Right, like no one distrusts people more because of social security, but but food stamps it is a source of distrust, right? Welfare is a source of distrust. Social security is not a source of distrust, and it's because everybody gets it, right? And people are seeing, oh, you worked your whole life, you know, you should get some help to actually have a retirement. Like pe people don't. It depends on the kind of welfare program. Now, on my view, there are some targeted programs that I think are grounds for increasing trust because you can look at them and tell that there's not much waste and that it seems to be providing a concrete benefit. Head Start's an example where you reach out to three and four-year-olds and provide them with benefits. A lot of people think those benefits from like having more nutrition and stuff like that through Head Start and having activities will translate into lifetime gains. That's very controversial, but it's not very controversial that it helps poor kids to eat and stuff like that. So that's good for them, at least at the moment. <laughs> And I think even libertarians are going to like not be especially worried about school lunches and stuff like that. Just feeding feeding kids. Not a lot of people are like, well, you know, most libertarians are like, well, you know, if we could get rid of the warfare state and like protect civil liberties and not have the crazy prison system, then I'm, I'm not going to worry about feeding the kids redistribution until we get to the big stuff, you know, <laughs> even if they're worried about it. So Head Start is a case in the U.S. where it provides more economic security directly to the poor, creates a better sense of economic security. But the big one that I focus on is a program that began in Brazil, and there is called Bolsa Familia. And what it does is it says that, and remember, Brazil has some extremely underdeveloped parts of the country, right, because of the rainforest and those kinds of things. Big issue for, say, the Catholic Church in Brazil is just getting priests out there. It's one reason they've considered allowing married priests in the area in order to ordain more people. So there's a lot of far-flung poverty in Brazil. And Bolsa Familia says, look to mothers, if you get your kid vaccinated and send them to school, we'll pay you a little bit every month. And I say it to moms because the dads just sometimes just aren't there, but the moms usually are. And that program seems to have, in a very clear way, reduced poverty, so much so that 40 different countries have adopted similar programs. And I think that helps in lots of ways, right? Like poor kids get educated, 
They interact with other people. That helps. They're able to join the workforce in ways that I think help economic growth and economic security for them, but also for others, laying the groundwork for more economic security through social programs and or charity. I think it helps that people are healthy and that people know that one another are healthy and protected from disease and that kids are able to get into the, like, the other people besides their parents in local communities just monitoring their health. So I think Bolsa Familia has got all kinds of benefits, but it also has kinds of, certain kinds of benefits for trust. And there is evidence that more economic security does boost trust in government. Social trust more dicey. We don't know, but I suspect it does too. If you grow up and you aren't worried all the time about if you're going to get to eat and really basic stuff like that, because then I think it creates like theft conditions. You know, people get very desperate. It creates social conditions for, for extreme poverty creates conditions for distrust in impoverished communities and people who, who pass through those communities. Social Security is already a program, obviously, in place in the United States. What's a program you would offer up that would foster a lot more trust in the United States in regards to welfare? Here, I don't know. I mean, our welfare state, welfare state is quite large. Things that would reduce apparent corruption in the welfare state and how benefits are distributed might help, like streamlining things or having an eight, a, a negative income tax or something like that. Something that would streamline things, make them more efficient make them more universal, make them more, more trusted in terms of just their ability to, to move quickly and uncorruptly. But I do think there is one thing, we don't have evidence on this, but this is, this is, so this is a bet, okay? This is seen as a left-wing thing, but it isn't really necessarily. Where every child born gets a small set of bonds or investments or assets that grow over the course of their lives. The UK had this for a couple of years. Cory Booker's proposed this as baby bonds. So kids grow up and they know they've got a nest egg for when they're adults. And that's provided by society. And if people don't resent that too much because you're giving babies something, <laughs> who's going to be mad about that? Like there's so many, we spend money on so much worse things than giving babies some stuff. Kids would grow up and have the sense that, okay, when I'm an adult, like this is a lot of the distrust I think that millennials have. Millennials are very low social trust. But we haven't seen how much they distrust different generations. And my guess is they don't trust boomers much at all which is why we get all these memes, right? Because the sense is that the boomers ate the seed corn. The World War II generation like laid the foundation for them. They lived it up and now everything's expensive. Education is more expensive. Healthcare is more expensive. Housing is more expensive. And they can't, can't get a break. And then their parents blame them for being lazy or you know whatever. So you want generations to grow up to trust the parents. <laughs> And that means that the parents' generation needs to move socially in ways that make sure that their kids are doing better. And I think the boomers just kind of thought, well, you know, we're good people and like we had a revolution and we care about the poor and all this stuff. And then they just allowed all these policies to go through that they didn't really see were raising costs. So one thing we can do to help to restore trust is to try to reduce some of those costs so people don't feel like they're screwed over by their societies. One thing I think would help is housing reform to make it cheaper to build housing so the housing prices go down, particularly in urban areas. So this is going to help trust in a couple of different ways. First, it will create more economic security because there'll be higher paying jobs for the working poor because they can actually afford to live in cities now. It's also the case that most of our increase in economic inequality is not due to income, but due to real estate. So people in San Francisco and New York City doing the not in my backyard stuff. And that's upward redistribution, right? So it's unjust on everybody's view. And if we could find ways of relaxing those restrictions so that poor housing can be built and people can live in cities, that's also going to increase economic growth because, as Adam Smith pointed out, the division of labor gets most extended in cities and people can build a lot more productivity. So you can have lots of poor people living in San Francisco. It's very hard to live as a poor person in San Francisco. It's very hard to be poor in San Francisco because it's very hard to have a place to live. And this is a group of people that count themselves as very, very progressive, and they got a homelessness problem. Why? Housing's expensive. It's hard to even have a, a church property where you can have people have a homeless shelter, right? Because rent's expensive. Home, housing's expensive. It doesn't have to be. So we could get more economic equality and more economic growth and more economic security if we had housing reform and a complete aggressive attack on NIMBYism, the not in my backyard kind of attitudes. This even happened in my hometown in South Alabama, Fair Alabama, where 
one of the city councilmen ran on the platform of preventing more unsightly housing from being built in my upper crust suburb of Mobile, Alabama. And that was basically a way of saying to the upper middle class, yeah, we won't have this ugly apartment complexes in town and oh, they're just so unsightly. And who wants to deal with all that ugliness in our town? Our town is so beautiful. It's that kind of mentality. I live in Seattle, so I see a lot of those dynamics at play and the cost is just unreal. The cost is high. You've given us a lot of the theoretical and systems level analysis. What are some and prescriptions? What are some things that you would recommend individuals can do in their communities to foster more of the social and political trust? Well, one thing is just to be trustworthy, like just be a good neighbor, right? Be someone you can you can count on to help out and to to uh, keep promises and those kinds of be a good driver, you know, just really basic, really simple, 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 simple. Another thing you can do is to be involved in associations that help you to interact with people that aren't really like you and to raise your children within those associations. So diverse churches or churches with lots of different, at least like income levels and cultures in them, or churches that serve poor communities where you're involved in charity work, where things like that, if you're in a soup kitchen in a city somewhere and you're interacting with people who are different from you. So I think getting in contact with other human beings and to see who they are, because most of the time our opinions of people improve when we interact with them rather than, than fall. So be trustworthy, join a club, join a church, develop cross-cutting identities with people so you can connect with them that aren't about politics. Maybe do a little bit less politics, a little more church or a little more service work. Watch. I mean, I should take this advice myself of watching less cable news and being more involved. COVID makes it hard to do the charitable activities of your church. So you just kind of, you try to give more money, but it's difficult right now to be more involved in associations. But I think, I think that does help, but really matters for your kids. Because I think children learn to trust in part by watching how their parents interact with strangers. Someone new comes to the house, children hide behind their parents or they hide behind a chair because they're often shy. It takes them a little while to warm up to family, you know, that kind of thing. And because they're taking cues from their parents and a lot there, I think you can affect social trust levels by how you, be, by how you behave with your children. So I think that matters too. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for coming on the show and analyzing our current crisis of trust. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully there are some reasons to be a little optimistic, but I understand if people are a little bit pessimistic in our current moment. But thanks again. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. I hope that the democratic, pro the basic democratic process remains intact, as I think it has been. I think things should improve in some respects, particularly once we get beyond this virus. Thank you for listening to Damn the Absolute. I hope you found our conversation worthwhile. We would love it if you could leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that is Stitcher, iTunes, CastBox, or one of the many other options available to you. It goes a long way in helping us to build a community committed to fruitful ideas. See you next time.